I normally at the end of the podcast ask people how they want to be remembered, but I want to actually ask you how you want Danielle to be remembered. This episode of Invested is dedicated to the memory of Danielle Waldman and Noam Shai, who were murdered on October 7th. Sometime seven, eight months ago, I sat down and interviewed Ayal Waldman, uh, who's here with me again uh, for this podcast. A lot has changed in your life and in the world uh, since October 7th, and I'm happy that you were willing to come back again for another conversation. I actually want to start this conversation in a place I didn't think I was going to start it, but literally 10 minutes ago, as I was walking down the block to come in here, I got a WhatsApp from a friend of mine who said, good news, it looks like Ayal is going to get the Israel Prize after all. Uh, literally 10 minutes ago, as I walked down the block, I, or, do you even know this? I know that there's going to be an Israel Prize ceremony on the Independence Day. Uh, I haven't yet received an official notice that I have received the prize. Okay. So for those listening, there's been a little bit of a drama uh, around Ayal. For those who don't know, didn't listen to the last episode, Ayal is the founder of Mellanox, a company that was sold to NVIDIA and is really at the heart, the beating heart of NVIDIA's rise in AI. There's the GPUs and then there's the interconnects, which are developed by Mellanox and Ayal. And once every few years, I don't remember how many, it's instituted by Prime Minister Bennett, they now give a Israel Prize, which is the highest prize in the country for entrepreneurship. No, it was not initiated by, by Bennett. No? It's uh, 71 years old. No, not the Israel Prize, the the one in entrepreneurship. Oh, I don't know. Okay, maybe. Yeah, the one in entrepreneurship. And the Israel Prize is the most prestigious prize uh, in Israel. And uh, seemingly, maybe you know more than I do, it was going to be awarded to, to Ayal. I can't think of anyone more deserving, candidly, than you uh, to receive the prize. And then it was a political upheaval about it. You want to describe it? Uh, you had a passionate appearance in the Knesset. Or you prefer not to talk about it. Yeah, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think what's the most important thing is that uh, we're getting back to normal and the way it should work is working. And I think it's a small uh, accomplishment uh, in getting the right way Israel should be managed uh, right. And uh, I think the professional committees are the ones that should decide who's getting the prizes and who's not, and not anyone else. The uh, I appreciate you saying that, by the way. The I uh, appreciate it too. The <laughs> the I think your your career as an entrepreneur in this particular moment right now. I'm not talking about the moment in Israel. I mean the moment of artificial intelligence is is quite striking. Um, Last time we were here, we talked about the origins of Galileo and then the opening of Mellanox and the transaction with NVIDIA. One of the things I found striking is that Jensen, CEO of NVIDIA, has, I would say, been incredibly supportive of both the Mellanox team in Israel, very outspoken about it, and what's gone on here uh, since October 7th. Has that surprised you in any way? Or no, I think Jensen has uh, his heart in the right place. And I think he realizes the contribution and the importance of Israel. I think he was a supporter of uh, Israel even before that. Uh, Jensen uh, is also supporting uh, us employing the Palestinian employees. And uh, I think would have liked us to increase the number of uh, Palestinian employees. Uh, so I think it's, it's the right thing to do. You know, Mellanox today contributes more than $13 billion to the revenues of NVIDIA. So it's a significant part. And they were growing, so I think the synergy between Mellanox and NVIDIA has obviously gone very well. As the result, NVIDIA is worth more than $2.2 trillion, became the third largest uh, in terms of market cap uh, in the world. So I think it's a great uh, great acquisition, a great synergy, and great uh, you know merger of the two companies and technologies. How important is the Mellanox team that's still here, obviously, and grown? It's growing very it, fast. Yes. Going very fast, not just to NVIDIA, but to the future of AI. Look, AI, it's a simple thing. It's all based on data. The faster you can read data, and the more data you can read in a period of uh, time, the more intelligent you become. So the more concise your decisions are, the more correct your decisions are, the, the, the more data you look at uh, per second. What we do is we're being more data faster than anyone else with the lowest latency, uh, so that the GPU 
the main processor can analyze more data per second, and that's why we are and Nvidia can build the most intelligent, you know, supercomputers or computers in the world. So it's it's very very important with the architecture. You have the CPU, you have the interconnect, and you have the memory. So Nvidia is taking care of the GPU now of the CPU of the brain. Nvidia through Mellanox is now also taking care of the interconnect and now the memory, something that uh, needs to be improved as well. And when you think about the future of Israel's position in the world of AI, what do you think kind of comes out of Mellanox and Nvidia over the coming decade? First, uh, like you rolled out of Galileo, I mean, and then did Mellanox. That was one of the early chip companies in the in the nineties, and I think Mellanox plays a role on that. Mellanox and Nvidia. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, I think uh, Mellanox and Nvidia is a significant role in artificial intelligence around the world. We build the infrastructure to enable everything on top of us to run faster and uh, be more efficient and be able to do more things that before could not have been achieved, could not have been done. And it's uh, very significant for, uh, you know, all of humankind. I think the things we can find, things we can do with uh, supercomputers, with uh, artificial intelligence, and with just supercomputers for science and for everything else is very, very significant. If you were advising- I think we'll live healthier lives, more secure life, uh, much better lives than uh, every year that goes on, and we have more AI applications running next to us. I want to come back to that more secure thing in a second, but if you were advising the Israeli government or Israeli entrepreneurs, whoever you think is uh, important, and what we need to do right now in the world of AI, what would it be? It, it has like multiple uh, facets. The number one is deal with AI itself. So the first, the building blocks, the hardware, the infrastructure, uh, you know, whether it's uh, electronic, photonics, the basic stuff, that builds the infrastructure, then the silicon, then the architecture, then the middleware, then the building blocks of you know uh, LNM and stuff like this. So basically, the building blocks of AI is very important. On top of that, the utilization of AI into different markets, into different applications like fintech, like agritech, like food tech, like uh, everything you can think of, legal stuff, healthcare, everything can use AI. So I think first we need to be involved in the infrastructure, in the basic building blocks of AI. On top of that, also the middleware that provides engines to everybody on top of that, and then the application themselves, and we should play in all three or four categories uh, in Israel. And wh- what should we do practically in order to play in those categories? I think we are playing already in those categories. We, we have the infrastructure with uh, NVIDIA, Mellanox, and I think there are more companies trying to do that. We have middleware companies like uh, AI21 uh, and 21 AI. Yeah. Uh, we have more companies uh, being built up. There's more research in Weizmann Institute, in Tel Aviv University, in the Technion, in Be'er Sheva, in other places, uh, Barilan, that are very successful with AI. And we're seeing a lot of companies. I've invested in multiple companies in FinTech, AgriTech, FoodTech, and, and many other places that they're doing a lot of uh, augmented reality. Uh, that's very interesting uh, that all of them has to do with AI. Would you encourage the government to do anything? I think the government should... Uh, Number one, uh, make sure our education is enhanced and we have the number one education related to AI. There's talks about building now an AI institute and uh, there uh, should be some budget there. I think we should attract talent from outside of Israel to come here for sabbaticals, to come here for their postdocs, uh, to do and, and bring the best minds to Israel for short periods of time, like two, three years, uh, that will leave their students here with a lot of knowledge, a lot of capability, and will continue their way uh, with uh, AI research uh, in Israel. So education is number one in the universities and in, in, uh, different issues and so on. On top of that, I think the government can direct some of the funds that intended to encourage startups or venture capital to invest in AI. But other than that, I think the government should just stay aside, make sure the infrastructure for education is there. There is uh, funds for startups and then let uh, the economy do itself. What about compute and energy, right? Compute's a bottleneck right now. We need more and more of it, and it's gonna be a needed national resource, and energy to power this compute is gonna be needed. Uh, let's leave it for a second power aside, but I think, yes, uh, Israel has not had an entry in the top 500 since, I think, the 1980s, which is a uh, uh, lack, significant lack of capability in Israel. The top 500 what? Supercomputers. Supercomputers, right. Supercomputers in the world. I think we need to be in the top 250 at least. Uh, I've talked about this with the government multiple times. I hope now we're, we're going to do this. I think the 
capability or the when you have such a supercomputer it is very significant and we need to do something about this um, after that uh, it will bring a lot of capabilities if for example if you look at Google and Facebook they were um, funded when students had access to a lot of compute power right and once students have access or smart people have access to compute power and They can think of many ideas that do not exist today if they have something to play with and created many startups which may grow to companies like Google and Facebook who may be created and I think this will happen when we have this big supercomputer here should the government subsidize compute for entrepreneurs and people to make sure we have enough of it should it buy Nvidia boards I don't think the government should do that no no what I do think the government should initiate we should take the model from like Ulich or Cambridge or Virginia Tech so, so what we should do is like the government should like buy and build the first supercomputer mm-hmm. that's one once you have it up and running you charge for utilizing it so anyone that wants to do it for research or for industry pays a fee to use the supercomputer the next supercomputer within like three years or let's say maybe the first generation is two years can be built and bought from the revenues from the income you get from the first supercomputer mm-hmm. and so on so every three years you need to calculate what's the money you need to create or build the next supercomputers and When you build the next generation, you still leave the generation minus one working for students, for academia and so on. And you have income from the first supercomputer and, and it can actually sustain itself if you manage it correctly. Interesting. And this has been done in uh, other places in the world. We should learn, copy exact. We don't need to invent the wheel and just build supercomputers that then will fund the next generation. So I think the government should not, should, should not subsidize, but should bring the first supercomputers to Israel and then have it Uh, fund the next generations like infrastructure like you build a road or a train to build the first two yeah, and it's even more important because it will enable us to build better infrastructure much smarter much better uh, in the future you mentioned that you think the world will be more secure um, and in the last podcast you mentioned that we'll have kind of better psychologists or medium psychologists become good psychologists it's true also that mediocre hackers become better hackers you know with AI and and compute power and At least in my own thinking, you know, nuclear weapons were controlled by countries that are at least reasonably rational actors, but there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of agents of chaos and very irrational people uh, out in the world. With their access to this AI and this compute power and some mediocre hacking skills, they could wreak a lot of chaos. Might the world not be going to a place that's less well, secure? Well, you need to be ahead of them, right? If you keep ahead of them and uh, you do things right, then it'll be okay. There's always um, a race... Of arms between the criminals and the governments or the police and uh, I hope will maintain that the government the police will be ahead of the criminals this is the nature of man uh, I think we can uh, regulate we should be able to be ahead in things we do and so I think we can do but for example you know driving will be safer right the, the autonomous driving you'll be having drones that will take you from place to place so now if you come from Jerusalem instead of taking you 35 minutes it'll take you 20 minutes 35 minutes I wish it could be 35 okay, minutes. 50 you know minutes. What the traffic's like <laughs> oh yeah so let's say it takes uh, an hour and a half you'll be here within 35 minutes yeah and not only that you'll be secure and you'll be able to work and do whatever you want while this thing brings you from one roof to another roof um your medical your health care will be much better because your clothes will tell you if there's something wrong the same as the Apple watch today you But your shirt will decide what temperature you need to be in the food you eat will tell you exactly what you need to eat and not eat um, so you'll be much healthier much safer uh, crime will be harder and harder to uh, be executed be done the police will have much more uh, control much more power intelligence of what's going on so I think it's a good thing if data is managed by the wrong people and they put the wrong data on For the computer that's another issue but we need to make sure that this is things that don't happen one of um, one of my takeaways at least is that um, on October 7th here uh, was that there was a lot of reliance on technology um, which I'm not sure is correct by the way but that's I should say one of my takeaways one of the takeaways has been there's been too much reliance on technology and sensors etc did you agree with that October 7 was a complete failure and of so many things it's also relying on technology but also relying on human eyes that uh, did not execute correctly it's a concept 
that uh, should not have been in existence. It's acceptance of things coming close to the fans, both, by the way, not just uh, in Gaza, but also in Hezbollah, in the north border. I've been there and I've seen two Hezbollah tourists uh, taking pictures of us right on the fence and uh, the army didn't do nothing. I had the same experience. There. And um, so, so I think we had an assumptions that were completely wrong. We had concepts that uh, were relying on a decoy that Hamas has made, and uh, unfortunately we believed it. And uh, we've made a huge mistake also on the personal side. The fact that we had only uh, like uh, less than uh, two platoons, or maybe even one and a half platoons of tanks in Gaza, while both uh, our extreme right <coughs> government have put so many 25 uh, brigades to protect uh, the settlers, which is completely unbelievable wrong uh, because of uh, the settlers doing wrong things in the West Bank, uh, led to what happened. So there's so many things going wrong. And then on October 6, between the night, between October 6 and 7, there are multiple phone calls to discuss. And I think the people that have made and went to sleep or didn't do what they need to do uh, has a lot of responsibility of what went wrong. So I think everyone from the division commander of uh, Gaza and, and maybe two more division commanders from that level up to the prime minister all have responsibility, all have blood on your, their hands, and they need to resign. The, just to go, before we kind of carry on, I was just go back to the, to the point about the digital technology. So they had indications from digital technology in the night of October 6th. They had more than that, yes. Yeah, a lot of... Uh, they knew that hundreds of SIM, Israeli SIM, were turned on. Been, yeah, turned on, have been uh, lit, and lit up in Gaza. They knew that Sinuar is going down south. They had uh, four more critical assets of indications uh, that night, and uh, they ignored them. And they said it could be a drill, it happened in the past, and stuff like this, which, which is not true. So we had at least five or six very strong indications that uh, things are going to happen and the people at the top have ignored them. And that's why about uh, 1,200 now with its soldiers, it's about 1,700 people paid with their lives, were murdered, raped, burned, killed. And that, that's uh, a big responsibility. Before we drill down there, what, 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 is, what does it teach you, what do you take away about human thinking in this era of kind of, there's all these digital signals and intelligence signals, but the human thinking didn't kind of get there. I think I've always, when I manage Mellanox, where there, when there's doubt, there's no doubt. And Explain. When there's doubt, there's no doubt. Right. If I have a doubt that something might go wrong and the expense of it going wrong is very expensive, I prevent it from going wrong. So I put a lot of effort in front of something wrong happening uh, to make sure that it doesn't happen. So, for example, if I know this house is leaking and it might, uh, might uh, break down, I would go and close the water. Uh, I don't have a question. If there's a doubt, there's no doubt. So if there's a doubt that things are going to happen, if you're a responsible person, and you know there's a book by Andy Grove, Only the Paranoid Survive, and you're paranoid enough, uh, you will survive. If you're not paranoid enough and you have too much confidence and you think that uh, two, tank, two, two platoons of tanks and a brigade of infantry can block uh, 4,000 uh, terrorists. That's where you end up at. So you think it's hubris, not human cognition or not human perception. It was just hubris. I don't know the difference between those things. Interesting. Yeah. So I think it's uh, definitely human mistakes. It's human responsibility. Decisions are made at the top. And they have the responsibility. And by the way, there are multiple people at lower levels that brought up uh, the issue of what's going on. Yeah. And people ignored what they were saying. We had the plans. We knew of uh, what uh, they were planning to do. They actually said it multiple times on TV, <clears throat> and we chose to ignore it. I mean, the leaders chose to ignore it. In your own company, again, before we go down uh, on October 7th, you get something like from lower levels. It doesn't elevate up, or people at the top don't it pay does. attention. Why, why does it elevate up at your company? You think it didn't elevate up here? It did elevate, but they chose to ignore it. And why, why do you think? Would you... You were CEO, you said there's doubt, there's no doubt, but here there was doubt. And there... They didn't do nothing. Why? What's I'm trying to get into, do you think? I know it's hard to analyze it. I think 
uh, they had the wrong concept. I think they were living in vain. I think they were thinking were too strong. I think they didn't uh, appreciate the strength of the enemy. I think they thought it's unthinkable that we will be defeated, that we will be raped, that we will be humiliated. So they made all the possible mistakes. No kind of appreciation for the competitive nature of the world and uncertainty unfolding and people always wanting to kill you. Um, That's given. No, I, I, I get it. Look, That's what you're saying. They didn't have that. You learn when you're a CEO, you learn to live in uncertainty. I met today a CEO and he asked me about So you learn to live in uncertainty. It's part of your life. It's part of where you are. Always things can go wrong. Your competitors can come with something. Your vendors can come with something. Something can go. Imagine you are a provider to New York Stock Exchange or to Google and Facebook and a 10 millisecond of system going down costs them more than $100 million. Yeah. Even, and you know, with Alibaba at 11-11 uh, at Singles Day, uh, milliseconds can cost billions of dollars. So you have a lot of responsibility and you always live in uncertainty. Your job is to build enough shock observers, to build enough margins, to make sure that you don't miss nothing that can go wrong. And this is, I think, one of the things why Manolo was successful. We were paranoid, on, completely scared of everything that we had to do. We didn't even trust ourselves in many cases, and we've always put more margin of what we thought can go wrong, and eventually we delivered correctly. So, and this is something that's not been done here. For those who have been under a rock for the last six months, um, Eyal lost his dear daughter, Danielle, on, uh, on October 7th. Can you tell us about October 7th for you? You weren't in the country to start, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was in Indonesia. I was on vacation. It was a holiday. And you heard? I heard uh, that she's not responding, that she's missing. So I took the plane back. Um, took me about 20-something hours to get back. Um, they enabled us to land. Not with the plane I came. I had to bring another plane. And then it land foreign planes to come and land here. I got here, and uh, three hours later, I went down south. I found the car. It was full of bullets, blood. Uh, the body's already been taken. Uh, when we were going there, there's still engagements with uh, terrorists uh, on Monday morning. We were very close or part of one of them. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a good day. And you reached out to her. You, heard, you knew she was at the party there? At the I didn't know. Her mom knew. Her mom knew she was yeah. at the party. Yeah. And they called and told you she's missing. Yeah. And the f- guy in Sharon told me that she's not answering her phone. And uh, you landed and you went down armed, I assume, I yeah. hope. And uh, her body had been taken already? Yes. But it was subsequently reclaimed, or no? Taken by uh, Zaka. By Zaka. Her body was taken by Zaka. And um, I'll tell you, when I came to visit you at the Shiva, it was one of the hardest hugs I've had uh, in a long time. And, you know, in my life, we were there. Can you tell us about Danielle? Daughter. She's an amazing person. What was her, what was her fiance's name again? Noam. Noam. And uh, no, he he wasn't her fiance. He gave her like a promise ring. A promise ring. Yeah. Um. You tell us about those. You know, I actually want to ask an, an important question. You mentioned earlier that Jensen pushed you to hire more Palestinians. You always inspired me because I think you were a man of peace and a man of incredible optimism. Uh, you hired so many Palestinians in both the West Bank and in Gaza. Am I correct? Yeah. We had about uh, 25, 30 employees in Gaza. 25, 30 employees in Gaza. And about 175 in the West Bank. And do you think any differently about that today? Has anything changed in your outlook? Uh, for it, I, I divided two things. First, the short term and long term. So for the long term, the answer is probably not. And we need to do, we can talk about that. Uh, for the short term, I think what we need to do now is eliminate Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Uh, this is uh, not compromised about this. I think there's two units being built to take care of that. Uh, it may take us a few years, but we'll do this. Anyone that was associated with Hamas, anyone that passed the, the fence and participated in what was going on on October 7 will be eliminated. Um, and that's number one. Number two, I think in Gaza, we need to bring an international uh, coalition led by the Arab League, led by Egypt and the U.S. and Europe be involved, and they should come and have two mandates on Gaza Strip. One, there's no artillery and rockets in Gaza. Anything that exists goes in being buried in Sinai. 
and second is education. Maybe they should bring the Emiratis' education into Gaza. De-radicalization. De-radicalization to unradicalize the education. You no, know, yeah, I think I think they should have you know Western education that talks about music, about science, about you know paintings and love and and stuff like this instead of uh, hate and destruction. Uh, and then they should build like a local government from the six, seven uh, strong families in Gaza to be the technocrat uh, government for an intermediate per- period of time. Anyone IDF should. Uh, retreat from Gaza within three months to our borders, and then anyone gets close to the fence will be shot. Uh, no questions about 800 meters should be shot like we did in the past. Um, and then they should be the ones deciding who will build the next government, who will rule Gaza. I don't think we should try and dictate who's the next uh, government in Gaza, and also talk about also the West Bank. I hope they'll be the same. Uh, but we should have the veto. We can say who cannot participate in the elections, who cannot be the entity to rule Gaza. So we can say Hamas cannot, Islamic Jihad not. We don't say who will, but we say who cannot. That's mm-hmm. the only veto we have. And I hope uh, that within time, when uh, they change their leadership in uh, the Palestinian leadership and we change the leadership here in Israel, uh, we'll be able to create a, a peaceful agreement, a two-state solution that uh, will yield uh, the right synergy between uh, the two people, the Palestinians and Israel. I think until now the Palestinians did not want to have peace. I think uh, both the economic and the political leadership enjoyed a lot the current situation by getting a lot of money from corruption, and that is why they kept it this way. Uh, we always came with uh, suggestions of what the peace agreement should uh, look like. And I've done uh, multiple things. With the, I employed Palestinians. I donated $360,000 for a Palestinian hospital in uh, Gaza. I've done a peace initiative that took about uh, about 12 months. But then Abu Mazen stopped it. Um, I think we now need to make them want to have peace. How do you make someone want to have peace? Have them suffer. So we need to have them want to have peace, they should understand if they don't want to have peace, it's going to be miserable for them. Peace comes from defeat at the end of the day, no, right? No, no. That's what happened it, in Egypt. No, no. no. By the way, they think they won. Which so, so I think also Hamas now think they won. So don't misunderstand. We want them to... They've done a lot of things. They've achieved a lot in October 7th. Unquestionably. So we should not step on their pride. You do agreements with respect, you do agreements with trust, and you do agreements that are win-win or lose-lose, whatever you want to call that. But in a similar situation, you know, when my, uh, one of my board members taught me that if both sides come out of the agreement and both of them think they left something on the table, it's a good thing. Yeah. So we need to do that, but we need to make sure they want to have peace. And this is something that has changed, and we need to push for that in a very big way. I'm happy that now also in the West Bank, you know, what happens in Gaza, we all know, but in the West Bank, I think we arrested more than 3,600 terrorists. We've killed hundreds of them. We've gone to places that we haven't been in the last 20 years, like Anajah University, Birzet, uh, and more places. We're going everywhere we want, and we'll continue doing this until we get whoever we want. And in the north, we need to get Hezbollah, you know, up to the Litani, 40 kilometers from the border. I think now they're about between 5 and 10, or 8 and 10 kilometers north to the border. Uh, I don't think we're going to have a full engagement in the North. But once we achieve this and we replace the leadership on both sides, we should strive and make them strive for peace. Once they understand it's better for them to have peace with us, and we also do this, I think it's the right uh, ground to have the right negotiations uh, to build a very uh, significant coexistence of the Palestinian people, the Palestinian state with the Israeli state. I find it striking how optimistic you are about it uh, given your personal loss and how... Uh, I think there's only one way to converge. I don't think any people can rule or uh, be responsible on other people. It's never worked. And this is not something we should strive for. So we should do what's best for the Israeli people. And what's best for the Israeli people 
is to have a two-state solution. I don't think there's any other solution that is, uh, you know, will hold the water for a long time. How do you, uh, may I ask the question, uh, this, do you still employ the people in Gaza and the West no, Bank? No, Gaza, October 7, disconnected. Uh, people in the West Bank, yes. And we still employ them very much. Did you hear from any of them after what happened to you? Uh, not from the people in Gaza. Not from the people in Gaza. But yes, from the people in the West Bank. Or uh, yeah, not I sure. heard from one or two. But from one or two. That surprised you in any way? or No. No. Disappoint you? No. No. Because? If you have expectations, you're disappointed. You don't have expectations, you're not disappointed. <laughs> and what do you think is the plan for uh, NVIDIA for further employment in Gaza and the West Bank? Well, Gaza, it's impossible to tell anything right now, but... I hope eventually we'll be able to open another design center in Gaza. Look, I think uh, the economy on the Palestinian side is important to us. I think we should help them develop the, ga the Gaza gas field. It's called Gaza Marine. Gaza Marine yeah. field. I think we should help them uh, have uh, technology design centers. Mm -hmm. I think we should help them in multiple things. I don't think we, today we should bring Palestinian employees into Israel as a result of what happened October 7. But uh, we definitely need to build a synergy. And I think there's great synergy between the Palestinian economy and capabilities and the Israeli economy and capabilities. And we should uh, benefit Israel and, and the Palestinians should benefit from this. So yes, I think we should do this. Has anything deeply changed in your outlook since October 7th? The time frame. You know, it's, it's interesting. It could be that we're closer to peace now than we were before. If you look at what happened in 73, uh, there was a big crisis, and the number one enemy for Israel was Egypt. Egypt was our number one enemy. And my father fought. He was the second commander of our brigade of tanks. I was the second commander of our brigade of infantry. But you were, you were in Golani, right? Yeah. yeah. But that's reserve duty. I'm yeah. not, not into my Golani, but in reserve duty. Um, so in 73, Egypt was our number one enemy. And in 77, no one believed it would happen. But one guy, one guy, the Egyptians did not support him, no one from Egypt. The Israelis did not trust him. And Sadat came and says, I want to talk to the Knesset, to the Israeli parliament. And Begin, that did not trust Sadat, said, you're invited to come and talk. And this one guy, Sadat, has made peace between Egypt and Israel. And uh, I think it's amazing that from crisis in 73, our number one enemy in 77 made peace. I hope the same things will happen now. So I hope now that after 23, that there's been so much suffering, so much destruction, that in 27, uh, we'll be able to have peace. Uh, so we'll, we first need to replace uh, the leadership on both sides, and then either we go and speak to the Mokata, or they come and speak in the Knesset, or together, and there's one guy or two guys required to make peace. I lost a cousin on October 7th, and they're after you. Sorry. I lost your daughter. Um, October 7th, there's such a trauma in this country right now. There's real trauma around everybody. It's such a small country. Everybody knows somebody or is related to somebody who who was murdered uh, or raped or uh, or wounded because we've had a lot. Of, we don't even talk about them, really. We have a lot of wounded soldiers. Both visible and invisible ones. 100%. Um, I'm sure my son-in-law wouldn't mind. He was wounded in 2014, and he suffered from PTSD. And he's written a song about it. Um and uh, talked about it very, and he actually fought with the army to go back into Gaza now. And he's fought, and he's actually in reserve duty uh, as we speak. This is a country that's kind of emerging from trauma. Um, I think there was similar trauma after the Yom Kippur War in 1973, although it's hard to compare uh, time periods. What are some of the changes you think go on in Israeli society in kind of response to this trauma over the coming First, years? First, I think we're very resilient and very robust. I think we'll come out of this uh, stronger and uh, hopefully also better. I think the number one thing that I'm very disappointed is the current government and uh, extreme right parties that are doing wrong things uh, in the government, in the budgets, in being very sectorial in all the decisions they make. By the way, the Israel price is one example of that. Um, so we need to change the government as soon as possible. I think once we do this and we have a logical, 
government. And by the way, everybody outside of Israel is saying the same thing. If you look at the U.S., at Biden, and Europe, and many other places, saying the same things. Sometimes it's you look, you see us better from the outside than we see from the inside. So I think we're resilient. I think we're uh, very strong. Uh, we'll get what we will get the hostages back. No, you think we will? We will get the hostages back. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I hope in the next. Uh, you know, worst case, uh, I'd like to say less than 30 days. But, uh, let's give 45, 90 days. Uh, we'll get the officers back. I hope we'll be able to eliminate Hamas in multiple ways. And then we need to start rebuilding. And this rebuilding will be uh, prosperous for both sides. Other than the government level, at the civilian level, what, what changes should we look to implement here? Look, I think we have an amazing people. So, so do I. I think the religious people, the extreme Orthodox religious, they should take responsibility. Uh, I think they should be part of uh, the military uh, service or, you know, uh, some Shavuot uh, Lumi. National service. National service. So I think, and, and also we should look at the Arabs uh, as part of Israel. And I'm very proud to say that this time the Arabs reacted correctly. Yeah, I think you're they, right about the, that. The Israeli Arabs. Yeah, agreed. They have completely uh, don't want to be associated with the Palestinians. They want to be in Israelis. They have been murdered. They have been raped. They have been kidnapped, the Muslims, uh, to Gaza and by the Hamas, same as our Jews, That's because of their Israelis. Uh, so I'm proud of that. So we need to change some of our sectorial understanding uh, and that, and then on the uh, the extreme right parties that are part of uh, the government today, and also things they're doing in the West Bank, uh, you're seeing more and more countries uh, boycott either settlements completely and individuals, and I think it's the right thing to do uh, to make sure that we act as we should and not abuse uh, Palestinians or do wrong things in the West Bank or anything else. Do you think, um, let me ask a question this way, and if the ultra-Orthodox aren't willing to go to the military and aren't willing to go out to work, then what? I think we should, uh, it really depends if you think it should be gradually or it should be uh, done quicker, but eventually they should be part of this. I'm a gradualist in general. I think very few things happen quickly and that happen well, but I do think there are breaking points in history. I think we're at a breaking point in history right now. I heard yesterday a rabbi that's saying he's, uh, p- he's preferring to die than serve in the army. I, I saw the same I heard video. a rabbi that yeah, but, said that if they need to go to the army, they'll just leave the country. When you hear rabbis say things like this, you don't understand where it's coming from. And we have and this rabbi sure. and this rabbi is getting the salary from from me. No, I'm he's paying not. His that, salary. that one's not. But yes, he is. Oh, a he's rabbi. You say if him, yeah, he's getting. I'm paying his salary, and he's saying, you know, if he's a, need to, if he, if they need to go to the army, they will. So first, I'll buy them the ticket, <laughs> and second, uh, I don't think it's the right statement. I you tweeted know, at him. And, is this a promise or a threat? <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's and, okay. And, and you know, and and and. The interesting thing, they say they respect the Israelis that are protecting them and they're praying that the Israelis protecting them will be winning, will be successful. So if you're praying, why don't you go in and fight? And you know, in the Torah, it actually encourages you to go and fight for Israel. Yeah, I don't need to persuade. I had four kids in Gaza. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> so, but I agree. I agree with that. So I think we should... But just, you know, I, I don't like to get Change. into like the right and left politics thing. But this is not right or left. No, you, this, this, this is, is the left wing bear any responsibility. This is, this is not right or left. Everybody bears responsibility. Everybody. The left, you know, we've. It's been, a generational thing almost. There's a whole generation of people that need to kind I, of be pushed. I don't blame just the right. I blame everybody. We completely screwed up. I think it started uh, with the previous uh, chief of staff, or maybe one and a half, but I think with the previous. So. It's a concept that we have been taking for the past, let's say, five years uh, that is the re- put us in where we are today. You met with President Biden, right? Yes. And, and Secretary Lincoln. State Lincoln. Yeah, a number of times. What were your takeaways from those meetings? I think they're amazing. 
I think uh, President Biden uh, said four amazing things and he is very much supporting and protecting Israel and he will be there for us uh, forever. Uh, and he's the one saying also we need to change the government. So first he said, you know, you don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist, yeah. which is a very important statement. The second thing he said then during, uh, you know, weekend dinners uh, in his house, his dad always talked about the Holocaust and said, we've never been for the Jews during the Holocaust. And he said, we will be here for you uh, now and we're standing next to you. The third thing he said, you need to be within the envelope of the international rules of war law, of the rules of the laws of war. You need to be within the envelope of the international rule, laws of uh, war. And uh, which I think we are doing. I'm certain and, we're doing it. Excuse me? I'm certain we're doing it. Yeah, I think we are trying to have as less collateral damage as we can and we do everything we can. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And the last thing he said, you should always think of the day after. What is your goal? What are your targets? And I think there we're missing. I don't think our government is managing the day after in the right way. You know, we should have a plan. We should have a time schedule. It's not something that we should just leave for, you know, whatever happens, happens. Um, so he said those four things was very strong. He meant what he said. He's executing what he said. You know, when they brought the two aircraft carriers and a uh, number of submarines here, uh, it was not to help us fight Hamas. It was not to help us fight the Hezbollah or the West Bank. It was to prevent a third world war with the further uh, states or countries like Iran, Iraq, Yemen, and uh, other countries. And uh, when these don't speech, the big don't speech, uh, was made, he exactly targeted those people, those years. If you think about what's going on, you mentioned Yemen right now. This will be my last question on this topic. I want to go back to tech. Um, how do you think about this kind of regional uh, array where Yemen is being sponsored by Iran and Iran's not paying a price right now at all? We did attack in Iran. Or someone claims we attacked in Iran. People have claimed that we did attack in Iran. Right. Uh, the Americans haven't made them pay a price, right? They've just fired on the hoodies. Again, I don't know who's done some operations, but there were some uh, blow-ups in Iran mm -hmm. recently. Um, I think after this uh, operation, which is a defense operation, what we're now in is not an offensive operation, because yeah. this is a defense operation we're doing. After this uh, defense operation is over, I think we should work very hard to get normalization with Saudi which will lead to normalizations with many Muslim countries around the world. So I think we should very fast move to create normalization with Saudi. And I think we should create the right balance between the red countries and the red country, the red countries and the blue countries where the blue countries, any country that's uh, gray, Ukraine was a gray and it, uh, it's kind of exploded. I think India. What do you mean by, by gray? Great, it's, it's not identified with the West or with the East. Uh, I'll give you an example. Now, Saudi was completely blue. I think in the past few years, it went slightly red. I think now it's in between, and it may become to be blue again. I hope it will become to be blue again. So so we need to make sure that the blue countries uh, win the, the, the final game, the end game. And I think uh, it's possible with uh, you know the superior, superiority that uh, the United States has. How do you think the tech industry has been impacted since October 7th? So I think the tech uh, industry uh, was somewhat impacted. I think we've used a lot of tech in this war, a lot of AI and stuff like this. And more than two of my companies, the companies I invested in, have participated and helped uh, in uh, multiple things with AI. Uh, I think the high tech is very resilient very robust, even though we had about in NVIDIA uh, about 700 employees in reserve duties, still NVIDIA executed, and other companies have also executed. Flawlessly, uh, almost. Uh, hard, but yeah, I mean, yeah. still continue to execute, and I see also other co uh, companies do that. So we're resilient, we're, we understand what we need to do, and we're doing this, so I think we'll come out of this okay. You're optimistic about the future. I think, yeah, I think I'm always optimistic. I normally, at the end of the podcast, ask people how they want to be remembered, but I want to actually ask you how you want Danielle to be remembered. And she was. She was like, uh, she's an amazing person. 
you want to give some more details about her? I, I've read just about everything I think you've written uh, on yes. Facebook. and You know, she loved to dance. She loved people. She loved dogs. She loved the horses. She did the wake surf. She did the snowboard, scuba dive, everything. She was like uh, very much people. You know, yesterday I was talking in front of uh, Americans and one American uh, woman, girls, uh, came to me and said, you know, I went to the gym with uh, Danielle. And I only speak English. And always when Danielle was there, she made sure that everybody around me speaks English to me. And also our boyfriend, Noam, she said she, she took such good care. She was so sensitive to me, trying to help even in the gym. She didn't even know her, but uh, she helped. So that's Danielle. Always there for people. How old is she? 24. 24. 24. As we say, he's a chram baruch. Tada. And, and there shall only be happiness and smachot going forward. Anything you want to ask me before we wind up? You know, I think I think uh, you can have a critical role in trying to bridge to bridge between uh, a lot of uh, religious uh, communities and uh, non-religious uh, people, and I think it's very important to bring both sides uh, to to the right understanding of what the future should hold. I'm disappointed, and I've tried to do this as well, uh, to try and talk to Haredim. And I've seen this at another uh, try, try like this, and I don't think it's working. And I think you can have a big role in uh, bringing some of those things. So I don't know if you're doing anything about this. I promise you I am. <laughs> even a fair amount. It's, uh, But I think it's not trivial. I've spent a lot of time on it, even before October 7th. And I think it's it's not trivial. I am optimistic about it even very, but I think it goes through economics and probably not through the military to start with. And I think it it's going to require um, some very hard political decisions that I'm not sure we found the people who have the courage to make it. Yeah. I think we need to build the right coalition to do this, but this is something that's very significant. And I don't know how you see the high tech getting out of this uh, October 7 operation. Like you, I think there is a lot of resilience, and I think there's been incredible gee whiz technology developed uh, since October 7th. And I think companies, because they've had to get more efficient during this time, are actually fitter now than they were beforehand. And uh, I think this has been just a terrible, unimaginable, unimaginable tragedy and trauma on a national level. But through it and through the resilience, we've gotten fitter both as a tech industry and maybe as a people. Um, I think we've discovered something else. You know, this is you flew back from Indonesia because of your personal thing, and you went down south and you weren't afraid. We've discovered that our kids are incredible. Yeah. Uh, I have kids the same age as your kids, and we've discovered that the most incredible generation of kids around the world lives in this country, and they stood up and went to fight and uh, stood up for what mattered. They discovered, tragically, uh, what they're willing to die for. And if you know what you're willing to die for, you know what you're willing to live for. And previous generations here have had to show that. And uh, I think they've shown that. And it's uh, tragedy. Um, nothing makes a tragedy fully better. But sometimes the body, when it goes into shock or gets hit, yeah. gets hit becomes back more resilient. And I'm, I'm just... I'm blown away by this younger generation of kids, blown away. Do you see any tech uh, transition out of Israel? I see there were people who were leaving before October 7th because of the judicial reform. Not a big number, a small number, and I think those people have kind of gone ahead. Um, ironically, I ran into a bunch of people who were caught out of the country on October 7th and never came back. Uh, I don't think the numbers are large. No, but I'd say after October 7th, do you see a transition or... No. I don't. There are some, and we should be very yeah. uh, watching because if you look at the what's happening here, I'd say there's about you know fifteen thousand or what that are leading that matter, right? The matter, and if some of them start uh, leaving the country because of the government or because of uh, or, you know if if the same government is elected again, I think we'll be in a uh, bigger trouble. I I think that could be a challenge. I agree with that. And I think you know we need to work hard to make sure that. Um, uh, the government is um, up to the sacrifice made by this young generation and the people who have gone in there. Hey, I want to thank you for coming 
on uh, a second time. I think listeners will find this fascinating, both on the personal side and on the business and technology and AI side. We obviously share in your sorrow of uh, the murder of your daughter, choking up even talking about it. And uh, I wish you only happiness. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me again. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you.